me what I'd and if you don't, I guess I don't really have an option. But uh, we're in the Psalms, and uh, tonight we're at Psalm 37, which is uh, longer than most of the Psalms we've encountered thus far as we've uh, journeyed along. It's uh, 40 verses, but we'll see as we go through it that it's a really an easy song to lay hold of. I would call Psalm 37, and we've tried to give a title to each of the Psalms, a Psalm for the meek, the meek. And uh, really this psalm, when you, when you finish with it, I hope you can see that it does a beautiful job of amplifying a teaching which Jesus himself will give in the Sermon on the Mount, where in the third beatitude he will say, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Really, the Lord's comment in Matthew 5, 5, Blessed are the meek, arises straight out of this psalm, Psalm 37, verse 11. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. So sometimes when we look at the passages of the New Testament, we think, ah, something original. But what we have, what the Lord often did, was to take a biblical concept that he was exceedingly familiar with and cast it in a whole new light. Now I know when I risk using the word meek that I immediately risk being misunderstood. Because the word meek is not a real healthy word in the English language. It's uh, stood for milpitose and spongy, spineless, timid, uh, weak, all those kinds of good terms. And uh, that there's no concept that could be further from the word meek. In fact, when I was back at uh, Evangel College a few weeks ago in Spiritual Lives this week, I think in one of my messages I talked about uh, the, the, what the meek person is, and I said to the students, who, who of you wants to be dated uh, by a guy, and then you go back to the, to the dorm after he lets you off, and your friends get you in the room and say, what kind of a guy was he? And, and you say, oh, he was meek. You know, that's just sort of sounds like he was limp-wristed or something, you know, like that. But uh, a meek is a... Is a is a word that um, actually in the original languages as well as in the, uh, its original usage in the English language stood for something what was far different. I think if I were to define meek, it would be something like this, strong but easy to live with. Strong but easy to live with. A meek person is not a vapid, weakly kind of an individual. In fact, uh, the Bible, or in, in secular literature where this word meek is used in the New Testament period, it stands for a person who's sort of centered, in neither a person who spends all his money nor saves all his money, but knows how to control money. Or it's used of a wild horse that has been broken. It's no longer running free, but it has been channeled. So a meek person has a lot of spits, you know, a lot of fire, uh, but also has a gentle control to them. And it is this person, the meek person, who knows how to be uh, disciplined, gentle, and strong that is given the earth. Now, the psalm that is before us, which is an exposition of the prayer of the meek person, is uh, a psalm that has a very similar character to the book of Proverbs. As you, we've gone through the psalms so far, we've seen that a great many of the psalms really are prayers to the Lord. Psalm 37, however, does not constitute a prayer. It is in a category of literature in the Bible which is uh, called, for I guess lack of a better word, wisdom literature. That is to say, it is imparting a practical, folksy, down-to-earth, spirit-guided advice as to how we get successfully through life. Therefore, the psalm is not an address to God, but is an address from David's heart as he works through some frets in his own life about how God is telling him to live. One other introductory thing that needs to be said about this psalm, and if you're taking notes, as some of you do, I usually try to give some words of introduction to sort of set the tone for the psalm, is that this psalm is a very difficult psalm to outline and the reason it is difficult to outline is that in the Hebrew it has a, an, if you will, an artificial or menomical structure. Yeah, menomical, I think is how you pronounce M-N-E-N-O-M-I-C-A-L, which means that it is designed to be um, guided by an easy memory device. 
It has 22 verses in it, and each verse begins with a succeeding letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And there are a number of psalms that employ this technique. Like, for example, Psalm 119, which is a psalm in celebration of God's Word. So what the growing child is taught in Torah class or in yeshiva, religious school, is to memorize the A to Z of the law. And here is the A to Z of the meek. And most of the verses uh, are clumped, and you see if you're using the NIV that they are actually grouped by the divisions that are in the Hebrew text. There are 22 different stanzas you will find in the New International Version because there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And uh, it's sort of like uh, when you learn the alphabet. Uh, the, I had the difficultest time learning the alphabet when I was a kid. It finally took a jingle for me to learn the alphabet. Now I don't remember the jingle anymore but i needed a tool i people find this hard to believe when i tell this but i did not learn sequentially the alphabet until i was in the sixth grade and yet i was a champion speller i mean i could spell anybody down i just didn't know the order in which some of those crazy letters came but it took finally a jingle to create the artificial device to remember and this psalm is doing that well whenever you have an artificial literary structure um, I, I'm, 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 now I'm backing up here just a moment, okay? I don't want to infer at all that the Holy Spirit isn't part of the process. I mean, he's the one that, that caused David to, to use this so that people could remember it easier. So when I use artificial literary structure, I'm saying that, that some things like, um, if I were teaching on the meek, I would say, now here are the ten qualities of the meek person. Quality number one. Quality number two, quality number three. And I would go sequentially in teaching so that each unit of thought was a separate contained package. But when you're working with an acrostic, if you're writing poetry and you're using an artificial device like A, B, C, D, E, you're going to get a lot of repetition. And what you're saying about the, you know, the letter B, you may repeat down in the letter T because in order to keep the rhythmic going, have any of you ever written, by the way, an acrostic poem? It's, it's really a hilarious thing to do. I did it once on uh, Proverbs 31, which is also an acrostic of the ideal woman. Verses 10 through 31 in Proverbs give the A to Z of the wonderful woman. And I tried to translate that passage into the English text so that it made sense. It was a hilarious fun, especially when you come to, to words like X. How do you translate X when there's almost no uh, really wonderful words that begin with X? So I said Xerox copies were not made of you, you know, and uh, good things like that. You, just, you work for artificiality as, as sometimes, in order, and, but it means that you don't get this nice, tightly developed structure of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So when we go through this sum tonight, we'll find that themes keep reoccurring and repetitive, and, uh, and that's just the way the sum exists. But I think that we can successfully outlines some nuances of, of shift in thought, and I'm going to present three broad segments to the psalm this evening. The first broad segment is in verses 1 through 11, which speaks about the quiet spirit, the quiet spirit of the meek. And I'll repeat these as we go through section by section. Then the second uh, section, verses 12 through 26, deals with the hidden help, and then verses 27 through 40, the long view. Let's look first at the quiet spirit, verses 1 through 11, and let me just read, first of all, read these 11 verses and see what they say, and then we'll kind of dive in verse by verse and examine what's going on. Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong, for like the grass they will soon wither, and like green plants they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Now, do you immediately recognize this psalm? You've heard that phrase somewhere before, right? Commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will do this. Sounds like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, doesn't it? He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil, for evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found, but the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great 
peace. If you noticed a, a command there that's repeated three times, do not fret. And that is a first tip off to the need to have a quiet spirit because a person who is fretting is not able to have a spirit that is at rest. I understand from those who know the Hebrew, and I don't, but that the idea of do not fret simply means don't get overheated. <laughs> and that was before they had cars that overheated radiators, so I guess the whole sense of getting hot under the collar or wanting to spew out some hot anger was as familiar to biblical people as it is to us. So in verse 1, in verse 7, and in verse 8, this phrase is repeated. Do not fret. Why do we not why should we not fret because there are temptations in life to really fret and to become overheated when we're going through a difficult situation whether the difficult situation be as is the case with David evil men or whether it simply is an unpleasant circumstance and remember one of the things we've done about the psalm is saying if you don't have an enemy then substitute the word problem for enemy and we've all got problems if we don't have enemies we've all got problems and one of the things that problems and enemies does to us, it makes us emotional. We become emotional in dealing with them. And uh, the Scripture continually calls us to get our rationality in balance with our emotionality so we are not overreacting to stress and to negative situations. We need both emotion and we need also reason. And the scriptures are saying in those moments of life where people or circumstances are coming at you in a way that intimidate you or frighten you or un uh, seemingly uh, are directed toward unseating your equilibrium, then back off and get emotionality under the control of rationality. Um, now... What kind of times do we need this sort of word, do not fret? Well, we need it when we face strong emotional currents that threaten our peace. We need it when we face the temptation of wishing that we could have the apparent happiness of others who do no wrong, or who, rather, the apparent happiness of others who did wrong. And that's exactly what David is facing here. He, uh, he is saying, for example, that... Uh, do not fret, verse 7, when men succeed, that is, wicked men succeed in their ways. The, and his emotionality is getting caught up in that and saying, Lord, it's just not fair. And we need also to not fret when we feel that we can resolve matters by doing it our way rather than the Lord's way. That's why David in these 11 verses keeps having to say over and over again, Lord, uh, I want to commit my way to you. Commit your way to him. Because there is the Lord's way of doing something, and then there is our way of trying to resolve the process. Today is Dan Bogdan's birthday, by the way. You all say happy birthday to Dan. Happy birthday, Dan. It's his 41st birthday today. Isn't that great? Just kidding. 64, Dan. You're not that old. But we were having uh, dinner together tonight. And we were talking about the whole matter of uh, temptation is, uh, is really an attempt to short-circuit a process that requires a longer time to bring resolution. And uh, I think that's one of the real things that David is addressing in this psalm as well. Commit your way to the Lord rather than just take the shortcut to fixing it your own way. Remember, when Jesus in the first temptation was tempted by the devil to turn uh, stones into bread. There's nothing wrong at all with eating. But it's just that the temptation was take a shortcut through the whole process of normal development and waiting and patience and all that and get it with your own power. And Jesus, in his humanity, fell back upon the way that the Heavenly Father would have him function, just like the rest of us have to function and we have to wait. And uh, he didn't take shortcuts. And David is having to come to grips with that in his own life here. As in his particular situation, he sees the distressing problem of a wicked person that is flourishing, and he's been trying to do right, and he hasn't been doing so well. David, really, in these 11 verses, has three alternatives to present as to how to face these moments when our spirit becomes fretful. His... his uh, 
and he doesn't use these phraseology, but I'm trying to use things that we can remember since we don't know the Hebrew alphabet. We have to have hooks and handles to get a hold of this. And it seems to me that one of the things that David is saying to us about developing a quiet spirit is look ahead. Look ahead. Verses 2 through 10 reflect the truth regarding whatever or whoever is rooted in time and not eternity. And David's admonition to look ahead is, look ahead at those who do not do right. They are going to be like grass, which soon withers, like green plants that that die away. But you're going to dwell in the land, and you're going to enjoy safe pasture. Don't fret when men succeed in their ways. Uh, Don't do that at all. Look ahead and see their end. Of course, the Scriptures always bring us to that, don't they? Tell us to take the long view of life. I may share this uh, Sunday morning, and you'll pardon me if I use this illustration uh, a second time, Sunday morning if I decide to, but Hal Azell was our speaker for our men's breakfast this last Saturday morning. He is the Western Regional Commission for Immigration and Naturalization Service. Many of you know about him or know him personally. Some of you here know him very personally. His wife, Lee, has just come out with a new book called The Missing Pieces. Uh, It is one of the greatest books. If you want to read something that is a heart throbber, I would suggest you get a hold of this, this book. It's published by Harvest House. And here is Lee, who has her own uh, uh, syndicated uh, daily religious program. It's aired on many radio stations in the U.S. A very put-together kind of a person, public speaker, articulate, uh, beautiful uh, a woman. And in her book, she tells the story of her troubled background and some things that uh, simply in her life lay unexplained for years and years. She grew up, she says, in a home where her father was an alcoholic who kept, they lived in Philadelphia, in a tenement house in Philadelphia. His uh, basement room where he hung out after work was uh, lined, just wallpapered with pornographic literature. And he would go down to the room at night after getting off work. He would drink himself into a stupor. And then when he was drunk enough and mad enough, he would come out of the basement and start beating up on the family, which consisted of, I think, four or five daughters plus uh, his wife. And it finally came a point in Lee's life when she was 17 years of age that she'd had enough and she was absolutely so petrified by her abusive dad that she talked her mother into taking her and and, uh, I think two of the younger girls that were still left at home and the four of them got on a bus in Philadelphia and headed to the West Coast to San Francisco where uh, Lee's older sister was living and she was by that time married and they planned to get a fresh start so they... They left uh, her father back in Philadelphia. Somewhere just before she left, she'd gone to Billy Graham Crusade in New York City, given her life to the Lord, didn't know what all that involved, but it was different from the uh, Catholic background in which she'd grown up, where she had not had a personal relationship with Christ. She came out to the West Coast. She was 17 years of age, just out of high school. She got a job in a, in a place, uh, and uh, she was a very naive young girl. And one day, a guy that was a workman came along uh, and uh, invited uh, all the girls in the office over to his home uh, following uh, work for some pizza, and there was going to be a movie or something on TV. So she said, sure, I'll go. And the other girls, two other girls said, I'll go. And she followed this guy uh, through a, a maze of, you know, places and came to this ramshackle uh, old house and uh, got out of the car and went in, thinking the other girls would show up any minute with the pizza. And a half an hour went by, and she just was seated on the sofa watching the TV. And uh, the girls didn't show up. In fact, they never showed up. About a half an hour after she was there, this guy turned on her and raped her. And she was here she was, a new Christian. She just had really made a commitment that she didn't want to have any relationship with a man until she was married to him. And she just had, just felt so absolutely crushed. She didn't feel like she could tell her mother. Or she And she mis- falsely thought that if you were 18 years of age, she had just turned 18, that, that you, you, uh, if you were, had sexual relationships with a man, that you couldn't prosecute him. I don't know. She said she didn't know where she got that idea, but she, she just thought there was no use reporting it. And so she finally got out of the house, went home, and just sobbed for a couple of days. And she finally decided not to tell anybody and just put her life back together again. And then a couple months later... She began to feel ill, thought she had the flu, went to the doctor's office to find out 
what was the matter, and it turned out she was pregnant. She just really had a hard time with that. Where was God in this whole process? She left San Francisco area, came down to the Long Beach area. And you have to read the book to hear the story, but she wound up with some very wonderful older Christian people who were in a church, a Baptist church in Long Beach, who just had a heart for people that were coming through and just took her into their house. And it was in those seven or eight months of the remainder of her pregnancy that she really came to a vital faith in Christ. She decided that the only thing she could do was to give the baby up for adoption. And she insisted, much to the uh, disdain of the social worker, that uh, she mess up the form by writing that she wanted the child to be brought up, not just a Protestant, but in a Bible-believing Christian home. And she wouldn't sign the papers until the gal in the social welfare office had agreed to put that there. She gave birth to the child, never saw the girl that she gave birth to, and then picked up her life and started over again. Nobody knew this. Nobody knew what had happened to her. She met Hal about 10 years later. Of course, she told Hal before they were married. He understood. They never told Hal's daughters who were from his previous marriage. He had two previous wives. Both had died. And um, life went on. Meanwhile, her daughter was growing up. She did not know where, did not know her name. It was a missing piece in her life. And there came a moment when this girl, now herself married and a mother, feels a stirring to find out who her birth mother is. And the reason why she wants to find her birth mother, the chief reason, is she wonders if her birth mother knows Jesus Christ. So after a two-year search, there comes that fateful day when Lee gets the word, your daughter is trying to contact you. Will you talk with her? And she then goes on to describe the meeting that took place and how God put that missing piece together in her life. And and the reason I'm telling this story is that, is that for 20 years, Leah Zell did not see what in the world oh, God was up to in that extremely distressing time of her life. There was no human resolution to the problem. It just, it just was, it was there as part of the past. You couldn't talk about it to anybody, but it was there. And the human point of view is to look at this and say, well, hey, what, you know, what, what could ever come out of that that was good? And yet there's this powerful book that's saying, if we wait long enough, we will see God bring a resolution. And, of course, the Scriptures go one step beyond and say, sometimes we will not see the resolution on this side of the shore of eternity. I'm not suggesting that all of us, before we die, are going to get a positive resolution on everything we've been through. But what David is saying at this point is, wait. The person who waits, who doesn't take matters into his own hand, but simply lets God work out, he, that person, will dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him. He will do this. Uh, Look ahead. Look ahead to the fact that God, in His own way, is going to work in those moments of life where we just simply don't have any option uh, other than the option to wait. My favorite comic strip as a kid was Ozark Ike. Any of you old enough or comic strip oriented enough to remember Ozark Ike? Could I see any hands here? Hey, we got about five people here that know Ozark Ike. Ozark Ike played equally well, basketball, baseball, and football. He was the quarterback. He was the star of the basketball team. And he was the pitcher and home run hitter for the baseball team. Ozark Ike somehow always managed to be absent at the start of key games, if I remember correctly. And he'd be kidnapped or in some terrible place, and you'd go day after day reading, you know, as the team would get further and further behind in the first half or in the first eight innings or whatever. And Ozark Ike would be desperately trying to get to the game. Finally, he would arrive. And then miraculously, at whatever point he arrived, things would turn around. He, he had an ability to shoot the basketball. I tried to do this so often as a kid. He would take a basketball in his hand and throw it like this, the length of the court, and make it every time. It's my goal to throw in baskets like Ozark Ike. You know? And at the, at the very end of the game, no matter what it was, at the very end, if it was the bottom of the ninth and three men were on base and three runs behind and Ozark Ike was always up at the right time, 
smack. Uh, the homer goes out of the park. You know, If it's the basketball game, there's one second left on the clock. They inbound the ball to Ozark Ike, 90 feet away from the basket. He throws his famous shot, swish through the net. They win the game. They never lost. Ozark Ike never lost. But it was as always his trademark to come behind at, at the very last in just the nick of time. And I think of that when I, when I hear what David is saying at this moment. Look ahead. Uh, if the long view will give us an answer to our predicament, if there is an answer out there, but it's going to be a while before we see it, then we can afford to wait for God's time rather than rush it or mess it up through our own impulsiveness or sinfulness. In his time... In his time, he makes all things beautiful in his time. So David is saying, look ahead. And then he's also, that's verse 2 and verse 10. He's telling us, look ahead. Uh, they'll, the wicked, like grass, they'll soon wither. And that's the way with problems. They're going to die away. And verse 10, a little while and problems will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. Won't that be great to be able to look around in your life and not find any problems, not find any difficulties, not find any reason to be depressed at all? Just a little while. God's coming to bat last. And then uh, David says, not only look ahead, but look up. Verses 3 through 7. One of the things that can happen uh, to David in the midst of his being pressed is that he can become obsessed with rivals and with enemies. For us, it may be becoming obsessed with our problems or our struggles. And those problems and struggles cannot simply be switched off. They must be replaced by a new focus of attention. So David is telling us, trust in the Lord to do good and commit your way to him this involves a deliberate redirection of our emotions we choose to do this when the way that we're going doesn't seem all that pleasant lord here i am again i trust in you to do good i will commit my way to you i will be still before the lord and patiently wait for you i will look up rather than focusing upon the problem lord i want to focus on you it's exactly what paul and silas did when they were in the Philippian prison, where they had a lot of problems to focus on, including legs in stocks and a, and a ripped open, bleeding back. And uh, they could have uh, focused very much on that particular moment. But they were sufficiently grounded enough in God's Word, I think, to have the sort of spirit that's reflected in verses 3 through 7. Well... This is the Lord. This is the Lord who has control of our lives. We will praise Him. So in the middle of their prison experience, they're calling upon the Lord rather than noting their problems. I think that when we talk about rather than focusing upon the problem, focusing upon the Lord, we recognize that someone has said, when the will and the imagination collide, the imagination will always win. Have you ever found that to be the case? You've got... Uh, you're down at Mimi's restaurant, okay? So you use a real uh, example that doesn't have any uh, sinful connotations at all. And you're sitting there, and the waitress brings this beautiful tray of dessert. Now you have to have an iron will to be able to refuse that, because the imagination says, oh, look at that beautiful picture. And I uh, often find that when it is a contest between my imagination and my will, no matter how hard I will, the imagination takes over. And um, I've gotten better about the desserts, I guess, but I'm still very bad on red meat and french fries. David is saying, and by the way, we can apply that, of course, to to temptation in our life. Uh, the whole nature of temptation is to create for us a mental picture, something to buy. And that's why people who try to defeat temptation by gritting their teeth and uh, holding on stronger to their will find that that doesn't really work that way, that the imagination will win almost every time. David, therefore, is uh, putting before us, rather than a contest between the will and the imagination, he is putting before us some very pictorial imagery of um, what we should have in focus, like dwelling in safe pasture, God giving you the desires of your heart. Instead of saying, grit your teeth and bear it, saying you're going to sh have it, you know, shine like the, moon day, uh, the noonday sun, and um, it's going to be well with you. Wait patiently on the Lord. 
it will give you the desires of your heart. So delight in Him. Get a new focus of imagination and attention. Look up. Look to the Lord. Quit spending all your time focusing upon the problem or the enemy or the temptation. Look up. Look to the Lord. If you want to have some fun, maybe you won't do this here right now because you don't want anybody peeking over what you're writing, but it wouldn't be a bad idea for you to do this mentally. Could you take a moment and think of your five... Can you identify five things in life that you want more than anything else? If you could have your way, if there were no law forbidding it, whatever, what five great desires do you have? And maybe some of the desires would be uh, within God's law, and maybe some of the desires would be outside God's law. You would have to know your own heart. But when you're all done with those five desires, do any of those desires conflict with each other? I found sometimes my desires conflict with one another. For example, I want to lose weight, but I want to eat food. <laughs> so, you know, I've got to kind of reconcile with that. And uh, sometimes our desires conflict with one another, and sometimes our desires conflict with the Lord. So, that's David saying to us, well, look up. What does an attitude in life that says, Lord, what do you want from me? Commit your way to the Lord. The literal idea of commit is to roll over. Uh, that is, roll it upon the Lord. Roll your way upon the Lord. Trust Him. Oh, wonderful. Uh, easy to say, isn't it? Easy to say, trust the Lord. You know, I've counseled some people recently. Oh, boy, you know, the pastor's got to say that. I mean, the Bible says that. Trust in the Lord. But if you're facing a load of bills that you don't know how in the world, humanly speaking, you can face those, that's, hey, you know, trust in the Lord, but work like crazy. Trust in the Lord to work through difficult uh, interpersonal problems. Trust in the Lord. David says, look up. And then the third thing he tells us in having a quiet spirit, not only look ahead and look up, but be constructive. Uh, this is put before us in uh, verse 3 and in verse 8 especially. The constructive side is trust in the Lord and do good. The negative side is refrain from anger. And turn away from wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. In other words, what David is saying is, um, in the midst of your stress, if you become an angry person or a bitter person, it's going to bear its own fruit. So, stay on the constructive side. Uh, not only look ahead, not only look up, but um, keep your emphasis positive. This uh, section then closes, this first section, by giving the, a great definition of the meek. It's those who choose the way of patience rather than the way of self-assertion. The meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. The second part of this psalm then comes in verses 12 through 26 where the focus is upon the hidden help. The hidden help. Now up to this point in the psalm, the battlefield has been in the mind of the believer or in the mind of David. In his mind he has been goaded to exasperation at his plight compared to those who seemingly don't serve the Lord. They appear to be you know, doing better than he is. So it's been a mental and an inward spiritual battle. Now in verses 12 through 26, we see a different lens, a different angle of the camera at the same situation. This time we are not looking from within, but we are looking at our struggle or our problem or our enemy from outside, looking at the externals that are involved. And uh, therefore, in this section, David gives heavy emphasis to comparing the way of the wicked and the way of the righteous. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. See the repetitive theme again? The wicked draw the sword and bend the bow to bring down the poor and needy and to slay those whose ways are upright. But their swords will pierce their own hearts and their bows will be broken. Better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. For the power of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The days of the blameless are known to the Lord, and their inheritance will endure forever. In times of disaster they will not wither. In days of famine they will enjoy plenty. But the wicked will perish. 
The Lord's enemies will be like the beauty of the fields. They will vanish, vanish like smoke. The wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously. Those the Lord blesses will inherit the land, but those he curses will be cut off. The Lord delights in the way of man, whose steps he has made firm. Though he stumble, he will not fall, but the Lord upholds him with his hand. I was young, and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken, or their children begging bread. Another great phrase we use, isn't it? They are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be blessed. Uh, one commentator on this on these particular set of verses, 12 through 26, has overlaid them against these New Testament passages. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through 10, and 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 29. And maybe you just, just for our own edification's sake here for a moment, ought to turn to those tremendous words and read them alongside of what David is saying in Psalm 37. First, Second Corinthians 6. We as servants of God commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine, not regarded as impostors, known, yet regarded as unknown, dying, and yet we live on, beaten, and yet not killed, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, and yet possessing everything. Now, I would submit to you, and we'll... I won't read the other passages, but it's, it's, uh, it's a, in addition to that, there's uh, chapter 4, 7 through 12, and chapter 11, 23 to 29. I submit to you that those are simply an expansion of the theme that David articulates in Psalm 37, verses 12 through 26. That we are persecuted, but not forsaken. That in, there are moments when uh, the problems that we face or the enemies that we face seem so powerful. David faced, for example, wicked who were very resourceful. They plot against the righteous. He faced fanatical hatred, gnashed their teeth at them. And he faced overwhelming force. The wicked draw the sword and bend the bow. I mean, if you're unarmed to see somebody point a gun at you, that's a frightening experience. In David's day, it was point an arrow at you and you have nothing. And who of us has not faced moments in our life when, if it's not an enemy, it's a problem that's so much bigger than us and seems to be so resourceful and maybe even is directed against us with an intensity we do not ourselves personally understand. But um, uh, David simply says, well, these things will take care of themselves. If somebody has it in for us, rather than simply taking it on a personal crusade to defend ourselves and go out after them, they're going to fall on their own sword sooner or later. The weapons they use against others will be the weapons that destroy themselves. And it's so true, and I've seen this happen again and again, that uh, people uh, are like Haman. They wound up hanging themselves on the gallows they prepared for somebody else. You may have what Joyce Landorf calls an irregular person in your life. You may deal with someone who has a lot of anger and hostility. I wouldn't be surprised in a group this size that there are those of us who have persons whose uh, behavior is absolutely a riddle, a riddle to us. And uh, in, in, in a sick kind of way, and sometimes an angry way, and sometimes an evil way, it almost appears that that person may be bent out on our, 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 on our destruction. But uh, David is saying here, don't worry about it. Don't, uh, uh, in, in due time, they'll fall themselves on the very methods they direct against you. There's a great phrase in the book of Jude that uh, I think illustrates this principle, where it says that uh, when, uh, when uh, Gabriel was contending with Satan over the body of Moses, he brought no railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. That's a strange verse, by the way. What did it mean to have a, a, a superpower fight over the body of Moses on Mount Nebo? That must have been, you know, I don't even under, I begin to understand that text in terms of visualizing that. But the, 
the spirituality of that text is so very clear because what it is saying is that Gabriel did not adopt the devil's strategies while he was fighting the devil. He did not bring against him a railing accusation. That's what the devil does all the time. He brings railing accusations against people. But instead, Gabriel, or was it Michael? If I got the wrong angel? Michael. Did I say Gabriel? I'm sorry, Ray Boyd. I, something all of a sudden flagged me. I was saying the wrong angel. Uh, Michael, rather than using the devil's strategy, contended with him in the Lord's way and simply said, the Lord rebuke you, left his cause to God. And if we have to use the devil's means to get God's gains, then, hey, something's all goofy, you know. That's, by the way, where I... Hmm, this is way off the subject. I shouldn't get way off the subject. But I think this has been the whole problem with Oral Roberts, quite frankly, in the last few weeks. I just think he has used a non-scriptural means to get a good end. And he's wound up giving the whole Christian faith a black eye as well as being made a, a caricature in the press. It's really unfortunate. That, that, in my opinion, is a terribly unfortunate thing that has happened. And you can understand it. If you're head of a large organization like that, and Oral Roberts looked, at, looked around and he saw that you know, God had called him to found a medical school that would produce medical missionaries, and now the years have gone by, he's produced over 300 graduates who, have, who are doctors, medical doctors, and not a one of them have gone to the mission field. And he ascertains that the reason why they haven't gone to the mission field is because their bills are so high, none of them can volunteer. They're still paying off med school. So he feels that the Lord is saying to him, Oral, you're not doing what I called you to do. And if you're not doing what I called you to do, why, why should you go on living? Well, that's, I think that's valid. You know, we every once in a while have to look at our life and say, Lord, am I really doing what you called me to do in life? And if I'm not, then what in the world am I doing here? So up to that point, we're, we're perfectly okay. But then to appeal in a crass way to the Christian public to, God's going to kill me on March 31st, you know, if I don't have money, it just... Huh. It was such a noble end. I can't think of a more noble end than to send out medical missionaries. It's one of the neatest things that the Christian community can do. But the way to get there. Huh. And, you know, David thought of that a long, long time ago in terms of not adopting wrongful strategies to arrive at desired ends. How did I get that out of that text? It's been on my heart anyway. Mike Royko had a devastating... You know, here when, when we you know, we take a, pu a public position, we open ourselves. Everything we do becomes examined as to by the public. And I realize the press does a lot of things that are not right and that are slanted. But on the other hand, we should not leave ourselves open for criticism either. And the Scriptures say that a person who has a place of spiritual responsibility should be above reproach carries the idea that there's nothing in their life that can stand out as a glaring fault or moral wrong. So Mike Royko is writing for the Chicago Tribune last week. It was carried in a Heller Examiner, and he... Maybe I shouldn't get off on this. Um, should I, huh? I don't know. It's, I'm just sharing with you. I don't... You know, it's just a concern that I have. But uh, Mike Royko says... Um, I'm glad to see, he said, that uh, Richard Roberts has uh, joined my crusade for God to take his father on March 31st. He said, if you remember my prior articles, I have advocated that nobody send Oral Roberts money in order that he can die on March 31st. And he said, I'm not against Oral Roberts. That's not why I've done this. But he said, it's just there's so many secular people in our society who don't believe God speaks to people. I think it would fill churches in America if somebody would actually prove that indeed God had spoken to them. So, uh, so he said, uh, but, I, but I was surprised that Richard had joined my crusade in the same way. He said, how, how was that? How did Richard join my crusade? He said, well... I read last week where he moved. He just moved in. Richard and his wife just moved into their 7,100 square foot new home on the corner of the Oral Roberts campus, and that he has a walk-in closet in his bedroom of 592 square feet. He said, which is bigger than some people's bedrooms, and his uh, bedroom is 960 some square feet, which is bigger than some people's condominiums. He said, I would suspect on Tulsa market he could probably gotten several hundred thousand dollars for that house, and I would think that. If he were interested in his daddy staying alive, that he would have gone to his dad and said, me and the wife will live in a little old trailer down the street, uh, Dad, and we're going to not move into this house and turn the money over to your ministry. 
And he said, probably Richard then could have gone on to say, and Dad, we're going to sell our two condos in Palm Springs, which are worth uh, $600,000 each, and I don't want you to die. And, and Dad, we're going to sell our $2.5 million mansion in Beverly Hills because we probably have all the bathrooms we need anyway. And uh, he said if Richard would have just, you know, been forthcoming and volunteered to dispose of some of their uh, property that they don't really need, he would have cleared off $4 million of the $8.5 million or I wanted to raise. He said, so Richard should join me on March 31st uh, watching his father die on TV if he can find his way out of his bedroom closet. You know, it was just a, oh, you know. Now, I would, I, you know, I would never be for a believer saying that about Oral. But I'm just saying it. When, when as a believer, you take a public position and there are, there are things in your own life you might say, well, oral dessert, I mean, anybody that's head of a, you know, a, a campus that has an uh, endowment, or not endowment, but a net worth probably of hundreds of millions of dollars, when a secular world, you know, they'd be paid, he'd be paid $500,000 a year. Of course, you know, that's true. But we're not in the secular world. We're in the religious world, aren't we? And um, hmm. then, you know, we need to take that big thing and reduce it to our own lives and say, Lord... Are there legitimate goals that I want to accomplish that I take short circuits to do and I use methods that are not of you? Is there anything like that in my life where I do that? Lord, show it to me because I want my means to be as pure as my ends. And uh, David is saying, well, the wicked ultimately, those who don't know, don't know God will, will fall on their own sword, you know. And uh, the Lord will take care of the poor and the needy. We'll find that in the middle of being persecuted, that we're not forsaken. And that, uh, in fact, verses 13 through 15 suggest to us that David was sustained by the knowledge that the Lord was not going to do anything special to intervene with his problem. He was just simply going to let it go on for a while because the Lord knew that the thing would self-destruct. The problem would self-destruct if David would just simply hold on to his faith while watching events take place. There's also this sense, uh, as we read the New Testament interpretation of Psalm 37, that God's provision for our temporal needs, we read for phrases like, for example, um, I want to get the right one. Oh, verse 25. I was young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. They are always generous and lend freely and their children will be blessed. And we, you know, then, then immediately uh, the, uh, anybody that wrestles with heavy questions says, well, is this, a, is this a proof text that says that, you know, Christians nowhere in the world will ever be hungry? That there are no Christians among famine refugees in the world today? How would they quote this text, you know? And uh, what is interesting is to see how the rest of the Bible itself understands this text. That Paul says to Timothy, 1 Timothy 6.17, that our hope is not in uncertain riches, but in the living God. And that the abundance which we share in life may be either material or spiritual. Paul suggests that, that he knows how to be abased and how to abound. And that as a general principle, I think here we're dealing with general principles and not exceptions to the rules. As a general principle, persons who believe in the Lord are generous. And the scripture says the liberal soul will be made fat. And there's just something about God's people that they rush to one another's help when there's a time of need. That's why we as a church are involved in, you know, um, mercy relief and, and help for people that are needy. We read in the book of Acts that there were, you know, Christians who were facing famine and the rest of the church undergirded themselves to take something. Why is it that America sends wheat, you know, to impoverish to countries when their own governments like in Ethiopia are spending more for arms than they are to feed their own people? It's because there's a Christian conviction, I think, at the base of this country. So we have, a, we have an attitude of generosity, but... But that verse in 25 does not necessarily guarantee that there will never come a moment when we are hungry in life. Psalm 73:26, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. 
Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18. Though the fig tree does not bud, and though no grapes be on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no fruit, though there be no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stall, what do you do then? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. 2 Corinthians 6.10 Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich. Having nothing, yet possessing everything. Philippians 4.12 I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Paul is saying is that um, when we're in Christ, we uh, have a sense that we're always full. We have sufficient. And we can be generous. And we can be cast down, but we are not destroyed by that. There will be ups and downs in our experience, but God has committed himself to help study us. Then the third part of this psalm, verses 27 through 40, again goes back to the long view. We've already looked at that under the theme of Ozark Ike. But let me just read this section and quickly draw it to a close. Turn from evil and do good. Then you will always live securely. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. They will be protected forever, but the offspring of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous man utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks what is just. The law of his God is in his heart. His feet do not slip. The wicked lie in wait for the righteous, seeking their very lives. But the Lord will not leave them in their power or let them be condemned when brought to trial. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to possess the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. I have seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like a green tree in its native soil, but he soon passed away and was no more. Though I looked for him, he could not be found. Consider the blameless, observe the upright. There is a future for the man of peace, but all sinners will be destroyed. The future of the wicked will be cut off. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in Him. This idea of the long view that God is going to work out everything in His time is not new in in this psalm, but it dominates this particular section. And in looking at the long view, what are we to do while waiting? We're to to do good, verses 27 through 34. Uh, The Lord and the structure of life are on the side of justice. Since we know the Lord is on the side of justice, our responsibility is in the midst of whatever pain or dilemma or enemy we're involved with, keep on doing good. I shared with some people today who are going through a hurtful situation in their life and there's just a lot of stress and anger with another person. I said, you know, what uh, has to happen is in the midst of this, you're going to need to reach down within and reach upward and ask God to help you to keep on forgiving because the only way you can deal with this situation is to forgive. And there's no other human way that you can deal with this problem and be successful other than to forgive. And that's what David is telling us to do, to do good. Whatever is in your hand, your power to do good, do it. And he tells us that uh, in the long run, we will find that the Lord does help us and deliver us. The psalm begins with an admonition to not be impatient. Do not fret. And it ends, ends with a calm assurance. The Lord will help you and deliver you. He will save you because you take refuge in Him. Let this psalm, therefore, be a psalm of encouragement when you face enemies or problems that are bigger than yourself. And there's simply no way you can, on your own steam or power, address or come out of the problem. Trust in the Lord. Commit your way to Him.